Dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, welcome to this uh, fifth session of the series of uh, IPPN Knowledge Cafes. My name is Serge Kato. I am policy specialist in, SD, in the SDG integration team in UNDP, and I support the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, along with uh, colleagues from UNICEF, ILO, FAO, and UNFPA. Um, some of you have already joined our series of Knowledge Cafes, so you know about IPPN, so brief background on it. Um, it it's a network, it's an initiative of uh, five, uh, nine uh, UN agencies um, uh, to create a community space where we can share lessons, uh, provide peer support, and strengthen our collective capacities to deploy uh, appli applications of integrated policy approaches in support of the 2030 development agenda. Uh, the IPPN is a network that's open uh, primarily to uh, um, UN practitioners, but also beyond uh, to policymakers and academia and uh, other colleagues in the development community who are interested in integrated policy approaches in support of the SDGs. In this session, we'll focus particularly on the work of the UN Economic Commission for Asian Pacific, ESCAP, uh, their methodology and tools for systems thinking in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda particularly how they use systems thinking, systems mapping, to integrate the SDGs into national development plan. ESCAP has developed a framework for integration across the economic, social, and environmental pillars of sustainable development, uh, which includes a suite of tools and resources uh, to support countries uh, in their development trajectories. It is my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Aneta Nikolova, who will share with us uh, ESCAP's experience, practical experience in deploying systems approaches at national level. Aneta is, a clam is climate action team lead in the environment and development division of ESCAP. Uh, she is an accomplished sustainable development professional uh, with extensive experience in policy development and advocacy, capacity development and technical assistance to developing countries and countries with economies in transition. Aneta is uh, her team, the Climate Action Team, focuses on climate finance, the Paris Agreement implementation, and review of her greenhouse gas reduction commitments. Anita is a champion of an integrated approaches to the, to the implementation of the SDGs with climate action and green post-COVID recovery in the Asia-Pacific member states. A quick note on housekeeping, uh, please make sure that your microphones are muted um, to allow a smooth flow of the presentation, allow colleagues to hear the presenter. Uh, do you use the chat function to ask questions or share your experiences and insights during the presentation? After the presentation, we'll open the floor for an interactive discussions and Q&A. Um, without further ado, uh, I will hand over to Anita for the presentation. Uh, welcome, Anita. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, we look forward uh, to hearing from you what is UNESCAP uh, thinking on uh, systems thinking, uh, what do you mean by that, and how do you support member states with uh, systems thinking uh, for the SDGs. Over to you, Anita. Thank you very much, Serge. I just want to point out that basically this is meant to be two people's presentation. <laughs> uh, my colleague uh, Hitomi is going to talk about the most recent experience that she used the tools in Modifs. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide, uh, colleagues. And I just uh, would do just this is just a reminder to all of us about the five pillars in the 2030 agenda, which are people, prosperity, peace partnerships and planet. And um, when we looked at them, we always looked at them in holistically integrated uh, way. So the next slide shows you um, that we built our thinking on the green growth approach where we had this similar integrated and triple dividend um, related policies. Uh, double and triple dividend policies that we have been practicing from 2005, developing and practicing in the region from 2005. Next slide, please. So why we thought of using systems thinking uh, to analyze the SDGs and to support implementation policies, that is because uh, number one, we built up on the lessons from the MDG implementation. The MDGs were uh, quite successful, but and there were a lot of trade-offs, a lot of 
uh, targets were left aside for later stages of implementation. So at that time, when 2015, when the SDGs were really uh, adopted and they were developed and adopted in a wide stakeholder approach with a lot of experts involved in civil society, uh, we thought we need to find a way to link them at the target level so there is um, joint implementation of certain connected priority targets from all 17 SDGs. And uh, this way we ensure that no SDGs left us <laughs> back so we could also uh, help the approach of no one is left behind. Next slide, please. And uh, on the basis, the pillar for that thinking, was that at that time we were really advocating policy coherence and integration. We continue doing that, but in an evolved state. And why it was important? Because through policy coherence and integration, we could start as a government, as policymakers and the stakeholders aspire together, then work together with our stakeholders, with the private sector, with the civil society. And then this way we will manage the resources better and they are very scarce, the resources. So this was the thinking um, behind that. And what better approach than systems thinking, systems mapping. So the next slide um, shows you, um, yes, please go to the next slide, uh, that what were the issues that we were trying to address with this integrated and systems thinking approach that basically there were conflicting interests in many situations between public and private uh, policies. Uh, there was a very um, low rate of coherence, uh, integration, silo approaches were there. And we see now the results with this current com compounding crisis because of the resources the climate change and the COVID as well, right? Uh, also, this was helping us to see the multiple entry points in solutions of problems and to find the root causes and not only the, what is the immediate um, reflection of the problem, but also the root causes for that, which were really three-dimensional always. And then, ensure so systems thinking is one of one of the most exciting tools for the per, uh, from the perspective of engagement of all stakeholders through all policy cycles then uh, the next slide shows you also that through systems thinking we were able to address trade-offs at the policy level, the governance level, information level, valid, uh, evaluation level, and also time gap. Um, next slide, please. And through the systems thinking, we also introduced um, a different way of doing policy making, which had some steps, could have been more than that, could have been less than that, but they basically include a stage when you do aspirational uh, thinking, discussion in group, identify all the st stakeholders, create system diagrams, system models, then you do qualitative and if you can quantitative modeling and ad adjustments um, at certain time timelines. I think at this stage we could put the poll. We developed a poll to see how far is the understanding of the colleagues around. And uh, we will give you what, um, Nadine, what we give? Two minutes <laughs> to participants um, to fill uh the poll. They are filling up the poll as we speak. Uh, go ahead, you have four main choices to choose from. So the question is, um, integrated policy making, or it's a question of the statement, integrated policy making using systems thinking support SDG implementation by, and you can choose whatever you think. There is no wrong and right answer, but uh, this will show us what are the priorities at your level.
Okay, we are 37, so we will end up around what about what 90%. If we can get 100%, will be very good. Forty seconds. Forty seconds to to um, reply. We're almost there. Uh, we have like forty-five from fifty-seven people participated. So the answer is a strengthening collaboration between several. Uh, government institutions, also defining effective action that can leverage high impact, um, securing, creating opportunity for wider stakeholder engagement, securing joint financial resources. We're almost there. We have about nine people who did not respond. Let me display the results. Could, okay. Okay, so we see that uh, majority of the of the audience is considering this a very good tool for strengthening collaboration. So to taking out the silos that is really a primary primary target. Um, I see we have a very uh, um, also high impact. Um, I would also say that stakeholders is also a very high. Um, so majority of the colleagues did not see how this could secure joint financial resources. And maybe that could be explained when we look at some of the diagrams, right? But it does really have a very a systems thinking, a systems mapping by defining the leverage points, which are the points of most impactful action can pool resources and these leverage points are cross-sectoral. So it means we can pull funds from different sectors and increase the impact with, uh, with much less funds and duplication uh, with, uh, very successfully. So thank you very much for everybody for, for joining the poll. It, this was very useful. Okay, so now we can go to the next slide. Um, so we developed this uh, systems thinking tool with primary perspective, par primary focus on showing how important water and SDG 6 that reflects all aspects of water use, water um, replenishment and water resources, right? Um, in the ecosystems perspective, how important important the water SDG is and how it is important to look at it in integrated manner with the other SDGs. And um, these are some of the, these are all the targets here. <laughs> at the tar we did this analysis at the target level, which is I want to tell you the systems thinking at the um, indicator level is very complex. It becomes a different modeling, which might not be suitable for qualitative analysis. Okay, the next slide. Yes, so these are some of the basic terms that I used in systems thinking, the systems thinking dialogue and mapping and engagement with policymakers to do the mappings. So um, we explained to people, first of all, that we need to change our thinking, that majority of our, um, our deep understanding, which is below the water as the iceberg, is the one that influences our choices. And uh, it is often, it requires more time, more um, ease settings, and more opportunities for good and open dialogue to be able to reach these deep levels, to be able to do a good mapping and find the root causes. And it is um, very important to take the time when you're putting policymakers and to engage all stakeholders, um, maybe not in the numbers per se, but the the areas they work, like 
the this this the groups for example we have in the un system of civil society right of the different groups indigenous people all, all these groups is very important to engage them to have them another um very basic good to, to, to term to discuss is stocks and flow diagrams this is my engineering but it's really related to cause and causality impacts right but another uh, way to show this causality is through causal loop diagrams which also show directionality and uh, um, the the impact positive and negative or wh who is influencer uh, who is the influencer and who is the, the recipient so and also it systems thinking helps to understand the behavior of all actors engaged in a policy setting and policy development. And it's very important to look at that. I mean, Hitomi has been recently looking into, um, this is another new area we are looking into how behavioral sciences is, is impacting policy making, how we need to use these tools to impact policy making. Next slide, she could talk a little bit more about it. Um, we also looked into the meadows. Um, and she's, this is a lovely, um, I would say, environmental economist, uh, Donella Meadows, who uh, has developed very fantastic concepts and looked into economics, into in-depth, to bring more the the key issues that are be beyond GDP measurement of, um, of our impacts. And she developed this kind of um, important architecture, I would say, or structuring of the the level of factors, depths of the factors. So considering to the behavior of the system. So what you can change first is maybe more physical things. Um, it is um, many of us are more action oriented, right? So you go and you do things, you have an idea, you do the things. Um, then um, the more uh, in deeper you go, it's you do the information dissemination, engagement of users, the social impact, and then the depth, the in-depth thing is the consciousness. That's, that's where you change the thinking. So from, um, from a practical solar power station, for example, that you would develop with batteries, um, the first thing you do is do the, that, the, the physical thing, but then you disseminate the information, then you have the social impact, engage people around to maintain it, you create jobs, and then you create the change in the thinking. And uh, this also reminds me what a pond and you throw the stone, the first wave will be the biggest because it is shortest but biggest because it is very the way it falls down but the the ripple effect goes further so this approach also helps us to find the high impact leverage points low impact leverage points the whole leverage points are very important and um, we go to the next slide this is a very small picture but um it shows you the three tools we used in our uh, mapping um, that we developed. So we first is one. This is the tool, the twelve leverage points. We created a matrix and interactions and assessed them, evaluated them, their weight, and how to identify which of these interactions between the targets become leverage points. Um, before that, we did the matrix and um, a map being how they connect with each other with different colors means different uh, levels of interaction. And then we used a tool called Kumo. Kumo.io uh, is a um, free software uh, where you can develop fantastic um, uh, diagrams which illustrate your maps very well and uh, allow you to have good and impactful presentations, infographics, and uh, publications. Next slide, please. Well, this slide is to show you that um, a link, which is also in the chat, where you could find um, a, 
a huge amount of um, products, knowledge products we've put, uh, posted there. We have um, a lot of case studies with their diagrams as well. So I would be, I was trying to bring here one of my diagrams from Turkmenistan, for example, which is, um, do you think guys I can share? Uh, certainly, Anita, you can try to share if you want to share your screen with a diagram on it. Or maybe let's let's do something else. Let's first finish the slides and then I will show a little bit more diagrams. Um, maybe we finish the slides because then we have Hitomi's case with Maldives and I will show later on Bangladesh water policy um, that we've done, water pollution and use. Um, maybe in Turkmenistan, SG13, just for illustration. So if we go to the, I don't see Maldives slide. Do you see it? It's after this slide, right? One more slide? No, this is the last one. And did I miss the Maldives? Seems so. Hmm. Uh, maybe I didn't press save when I was inserting it. He told me, do you think you could share? Oh, I can share it. Let's, let's try. Maybe uh, let's try this way, guys. I would share the motives. The motive slide. In the meantime, welcome, Itomi. It's a pleasure to have you. you so Is it yeah. possible to see, guys? Yes. yes, I see it in it. You want it in a... This is, this is fine. I think I can work with it. It's just one slide. Um, so college, colleagues, um, very pleased to join you here uh, this evening, this evening in Bangkok. And I, as Annette mentioned, I just would like to share the latest applications of systems analysis that we have done on an interagency basis, um, with UNDP in the lead actually. Um, and with the support of our um, main consultant on systems analysis, Sustainability Asia. So we were working together as an interagency team um, in the MAPS mission for the Maldives um, to prepare the SDG roadmap for the Maldives. And uh, the approach that we took was to unpack key policy documents. So there was a strategic action plan, national resilience and recovery plan, um, and other uh, policy documents from different sectors, which were reviewed by our main consultant to really understand what are the key elements of policy which were important to the Maldives. So this systems analysis was further enriched by desk research. We also um, organized a series of stakeholder consultations to better understand the Maldives context and also to review some of the systems diagrams, the initial versions of the systems diagrams that we, we produced. And this mapping of the systems uh, in the Maldives um, focused on three complex priorities for the Maldives government. Right? First, the first was economic diversification, the second was building resilience, and the third was decentralization. So as you can imagine, these are three, um, three cross-cutting challenges um, and which lend themselves very well actually to systems analysis. And based on these systems maps, we were able to prioritize interventions and strengthen, make recommendations around strengthening policy coherence. Uh, we haven't quite reached to this issue of institutional coherence, which is really important, but uh, we have uh, prepared this roadmap, which has benefited quite a lot from the systems analysis. Um, the main thing that the systems analysis contributed was to be able to develop narratives for each of these complex priorities. And these narratives were shaped by the feedback loops that we found in the systems map. Right? So we were able to show relationships between uh, elements which were at first not directly related, but then when you put them on the systems map, you see this very often very neat and very strong and well-defined relationship uh, between different uh, elements of policy. And using this, uh, this um, systems map, the narratives that we developed were um, able to, to inform ideas around strengthening policy coherence and potentially partnerships for the modern world. 
And following this, we also map the SDG targets to system elements. So the next steps for this work, um, which was undertaken between September 2021 and January 2022, is a, is a, a review by the Maldives government um, of the roadmap and sharing of the systems map to facilitate interministerial coordination within the technical uh, committee, yes. Um, and, and the recommendations are that there should be further stakeholder engagement to activate some important leverage points that have been defined in the roadmap and really to look more closely at the feedback loops and to deepen social consensus around some critical issues which will emerged as really important leverage points um, for um, through the systems analysis. Now, ideally, we will use this mapping and feedback loops to explore and define opportunities to strengthen institutional coherence um, across positive feedback loops. How do we bring institutions which have whose, whose mandates and whose functions have an influence on each other's uh, on each other um, together in the committee in a working yes. group a dedicated program? This is something that would be really ideal. Yeah, I'm not sure we will get there. And uh, the second thing would be to really explore how new partnerships can bring these, these institutions with mandates, in institutions and stakeholder groups with mandates which should be aligned together uh, in new partnerships, which is, which is what we are all about these days. We're about uh, seeking new partnerships, right? And often um, unconventional partnerships, right? So the key challenges that we face, I want to share a little bit about that. So um, we did this as a virtual maps mission, I think extremely difficult. It was mm -hmm. difficult to understand the situation on the ground. Um, we, had, we had to really try to see how we could use the consultations to move beyond desk research. We had, uh, I would say upwards of um, three main consultations, but then there were a series of smaller consultations which were requested by the government, by which time this, the team's capacity was completely stretched. Right? And in fact, we didn't have sufficient capacity to take in all of this information. So the challenge is really about absorbing all of the information that needs to be um, kind of absorbed about the real life, real time situation, the real life situation of the system you're describing. Um, another challenge was simplifying the narrative because we collected a lot of information and, and mapping this, this large amounts of information is, is really difficult, especially if the system is complex, right? The third challenge with which, um, which maybe I haven't put on the slide, but I want to raise is really about institutionalization. So the Maldives is our most recent um, example of work, um, but it, it's maybe perhaps not the most successful. Aneta yet, yes, I would say yet, it's still, it's still evolving. Aneta will share some other examples of work that has been done in other countries. Um, one example that um, we don't have time to share today is about Mongolia, where in fact, uh, the work that was done in systems analysis went beyond ESCAP to, to, to actually um, be complemented by the work of the Asian Development Bank, by, uh, by um, uh, Stockholm Environment Institute, I think, um, and I think there were others, um, to the point where the Maldives government uh, really understood the importance of this tool and tested it within their policy environment and they have incorporated systems analysis in their planning processes formally. So it's a requirement to do systems analysis as they go forward with any new policy, right? And what they have done also, which is really important is they've established capacity within Mongolia. So there is a Mongolian systems lab within the national university, which is able to take this work forward. forward. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to you, Nata, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kitami. That was very, very fantastic addition to what I was saying and illustrating a practical example of how the systems tool is used. And as you said, uh, some some examples are successful, others are not. But for, I think for me, this using systems thinking, um, of course, not in one workshop, but in a series with the same participants in a series of exercises so they can really understand and tap into their own subconsciousness when they start thinking about policy making and implementation is very important. So that's why the example, but even Maldives, uh, despite of the fact that you guys did it virtually, 
um, event, so many consultations, and that is very important because it challenges, visualizes connections and um, creates a pathway. So maybe not the most perfect, but what is perfect? Our world is so unperfect at the moment, especially. I would like to try to share um, the Bangladesh Industrial Water Use Mapping. Is this coming up on the screen? Uh, you still have the Maldives slide on the screen. Yeah. So I have to stop sharing the previous one and start sharing the new one, right? Yes. yes. Bangladesh water policy. Let's try to get it. Is it, is it visible? So let yes. me try to close this window here so we can have a bigger picture. And just we need to have a little bit of lower picture. Um, yeah. I mean, I will send you all these maps after that, even more examples that you could share with all the participants with the presentation so people can look at it and even ask us questions later on. I mean, this is um, basically showing you the level of this, this policy was developed by interministerial working group. And um, you could see with that, we mapped the issues, the stakeholders engagement, there we have see some institutions and how they impact each other and what is, uh, even there's some directionality, who is responsible, is impacting who. Um, I would like to unshare, so we have to stop sharing this one and get to another one. I want to go to Turkmenistan. How is that visually? It's a little bit better background, right? But here we looked at the targets of SDG 13. So from the target of SDG 13, we look to the impact to other, to the implementation of other targets of SDG 13. And uh, you see this complex relationships that are evolving, right? So we see how national policies for climate action are impacting food production, are impacting ending hunger. Um, um, they need more information awareness campaigns. We see also the, um, the poverty issues, uh, building partnerships, and then the, it's connected to, to um, for example, for the needs of the uh, the needs of developing countries, etc. Right. So there is a narrative to it, but um, it has been developed by the national government. So one of the things that Hitomi highlighted is stakeholder engagement in these exercises of the mapping. And in Turkmenistan, we had more time and we had physical meetings. So we went further, we identified champions. After the first day, we identified people that understood quickly how they can do this mapping. Uh, we developed some tools. We have these pins with threads and SDG cards. And so it's like a game. People play in teams uh, from all the ministries, and then they start connecting. And then we ask them, the champions, to sit and write the narrative. Then we read the narrative to the audience from the other groups that look at other interlinkages, get feedback and uh, with each other, right? And based on this um, SDG 13 in interlinkages mapping, the government managed to identify the needs for, for more training and um, for the SDG uh, 13 for climate action. Um, if I have a minute to look for one more example. I think uh, one I have... more minute, Anita, then we okay. can look at the question and answers. Okay, I mean, I would send to you all the maps I have in PDF files. People can open them, look at them. Um, my, and the Mongolian report that Hitomi mentioned as well, which is very important because this is a year and a half work. I mean, that was one of the most luxurious applications we've done. 
and it started with identifying the importance of SDG 6 towards the other SDGs. And when people understood the importance, this is a country where, for example, uh, only surface water was important. The groundwater, they didn't understand. They didn't have enough geological uh, understanding as experts, the importance of it, which is a country with dry climate. And so then after that, they started understanding all the aspects of water cycle, water ecosystems, etc. And then have used this whole mapping for the national SDG 6 strategy, extrapolated it to the um, uh, Ulaanbaatar city planning mapping. Okay, so that is now we're going to do three questions. You want me to answer to that or we also do? Uh, those, those are questions for uh, discussions and interaction among the, okay. the, with the participants. Yes. So it's a question addressed not just to you, but uh, to, uh, to all <laughs> to participants. participants. So we, we look forward to hearing your views, colleagues. Uh, yes. How this has worked for you, if you have a similar experience of, or different experiences. Um, Anita, I see that in the chat, uh, we do have a question from uh, Pierre de Blind. I don't know, Pierre, if you're still with us. Um, uh, if not, uh, if you are with, if you're still with us, uh, uh, please, uh, please come in um, to ask your question. Uh, Perry left, unfortunately. Oh, but Perry we, left already. We have, we have an email address if you want to get in touch. Yes, certainly. But I think it will be good to address the question um, uh, in the for the recording. Um, uh, so Anita Pirid is uh, uh, wondering uh, how we can systematically link uh, the triple nexus with the systems analysis of SDGs. Um, we have analysis on linking SDGs that focus mostly on humanitarian development and peace pillars. Uh, but what she's interested in is at uh, the next level. Uh, show the middle ground linkages across these pillars with, but not exclusively the SDG nexus, but also taking into account the time factor. Um, the nexus is about longer term, non earmarked uh, program and funding compact. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, if you can see the question in the chat, uh, do you have some views on that? Yes, it's actually a fantastic uh, question. And um, I just don't know which triple nexus she means. You mentioned human rights and something else. Yeah, humanitarian um, development and peace. Yes, okay. Uh, for us, the triple nexus is food, energy, <laughs> and ecosystem, and water, you know? So <laughs> that's why triple nexus um, means different things in, in the UN system, depending on we environmental affairs officers. Yeah, so whenever, um, I mean, human development, peace, and what you mentioned, yes? Was, was, um, they, they're very interlinked um, and Definitely systems thinking is fantastic to use. What we actually have a diagram, um, I mean, to talk about human rights as well, um, as a right of hum to be as a basis for the human development would be very important as well. So we have mapped how human rights are reflected in all the SDGs as well. We have that mapping and to which uh, documents of the human rights uh, as well. So. Yes, systems thinking is very useful. It would be very helpful and would be able to help you also to identify the SDG targets that have that uh, impact on it. And um, the time bound comes when you do the leverage points. You could see that those with the highest impact actually uh, need immediate action, right? The lowest impact um, leverage points most probably take more time uh it's time is involved in it there is another uh, yes yeah. we do have a question that just uh, came from uh, uh, mohammed yasin um uh, working in silos is the limiting approach and that impacts engagement with stakeholders um for the that's uh, for his views on the first points barriers to using systems thinking approach in policy making um, so working in silos, it, it, he thinks, is uh, one of the main barriers. And uh, on uh, tree capacity development, uh, change in thinking at senior management level in specific countries to be more open to sharing and allowing collaboration and peer learning, knowledge sharing. Uh, I, I think uh, this um, uh, addresses, this looks at the issues of uh, capacity, capacity development, particularly at management level. 
uh, are there resources that the ESCAP has developed for, uh, for policymakers uh, on, on system thinking? Yes, um, on this SDG help desk for integration of the SDGs international planning, you will find a huge amount of knowledge products and you could download them for free all the time. Um, we did, we do have also a training course, which is on the ESCAP, the new ESCAP e-learning platform that was just launched at the beginning of this year. Um, so if you click on the link of the SDG e-learning platform, it will lead you there. So that's that's possible. That is answer, answering the capacity building. On the barriers, I completely agree. The silos are very damaging, and and but that is that is the reality, right? Uh, most of the education programs. Um, <laughs> 10 years ago, up to 10 years ago, were not that integrated. And um, so the thinking is to go deep into a subject rather than to see how um, your subject is influenced and impacted and is, is benefiting from the others. The most damaging for development and developed in countries is the fact that in being in silo, you're tapping to very limited financial resources. This was the last question in the poll that I mentioned. Um, there's a big effort now from UNDP. There's this big, uh, global UN um, financing, sustainable financing network that is developing these new concepts of integrated financing, which includes climate financing, SDGs, uh, Agenda 2030, and development financing, and post-COVID recovery, right? Because they have to be all looked at the same time. Um, so this is very important. At the middle of the crisis, countries were responding to COVID um, ad hoc. But at this stage now and after COP26, which uh, to my feeling is, is been very impactful, maybe not the, the most impactful outcome, but it really brought strong impact and especially in financing and looking into this, how we need to look at the multi-sectoral collaboration, yes. Um, Thanks, Anita. While, while colleagues are thinking about their questions, I will uh, 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 abuse the privilege of uh, facilitating the session to, to ask you some questions. Um, uh, Itomi talked about institutionalization, um, and, and I think that's that's an interesting point as we're working in uh, in Maldives together. What, what I found interesting in the Maldives, uh, particularly with uh, the format of the consultations, how that it, it actually did allow uh, us to identify already, even though it was virtual, some, some friction points, right? The issues of uh, uh, resource allocation, managing the resources between at the central level and, uh, and the remote islands, yes. uh, the local authorities uh, that really came up. Uh, but also um, the, uh, the, the diagrams, the systems map uh, allowed us to see already subsystems uh, that, could, uh, that could act as areas of intervention uh, when packaged as a whole. And I thought that was quite interesting because it points to, to leverage points. There were issues of strengthening capacities uh, at subnational level uh, that came up. Uh, uh, she also referred to the example of, um, of Mongolia, I believe, um, where there is institutionalization of the approach. So my question is, when we, we do this kind of work where we make recommendations to governments, uh, integration international planning, how do we ensure that actually uh, when implementation happens, uh, that the systems approach continues, right? that integration is included in implementation, not just in planning? How do we go from the plans uh, to actually uh, uh, implementation of, of programs and projects that is done in an integrated manner? Yeah, this is a very, very important issue, right? So we, these times of doing projects for the sake of one project and finishing in two or three years is gone. Uh, we now all, even with, within the UN system, with the evolution of the resident coordinators teams uh, that is trying to pull the national country teams together. Um, and this what we have at the regional level here, we have regional coordination mechanism. We're working on key issues together, all the UN agencies in the same uh, duty station. So one successful 
pooling of resources and impacts and now spilling down to the local level to the individual citizen is this climate literacy knowledge packages that we pre-created now with going to um, it was regional in english now we're going at the national level and then there the local communities will take it and move forward so um, i believe as un practitioners we need to strive as much as possible to work with the national teams for us it doesn't come organically um, easy um, because we have regional commissions, so and but we are asked to work more and more national levels. So we we are doing this quite a lot, especially the climate action, the SDG implementation, the VNRs, and um, the VNRs actually embedded in institution, institutionalized the systems thinking, the integrated approaches to towards analysis of monitoring, verification, and reporting on SDG implementation. So that that is one one mechanism that exists and because it covers all the other areas there is an opportunity that this is going to spill to the other sectors to the to the other issues right uh we i see a lot thank you of thank you Anita. So we, we, yes we do have a comment from thomas uh who actually raises an interesting point thomas o'connell on the, um, the, the, the political barriers, right? Um, because uh, I think Thomas is right. Uh, this, it's, the barriers are not due to a lack of technical understanding of, uh, of the issues. Uh, it, it's really um, uh, political issues at senior level. Um, so uh, Thomas says that if systems thinking stays largely at the level of technical staff instead of senior leadership, it may not have optimal impact. That senior level of engagement would uh, need to be multi-sectoral and inclusive of civil society and other uh, non-government actors. That is a fantastic point, right? Um, but I think we see a strong evolution in all members in all countries uh, into that direction. When we started working on um, SDG 6 um, in 2016, 17 to 16, 17, with this first round of countries like Fiji, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, nobody was understanding what we are trying to do. Towards the end of the workshops, they had a better picture. What we did in Fiji, we connected, we just, they, they were saying, why do we need this? We don't need these SDGs. And then we had to go and crack with them and sit together and connect the targets of the SDGs with their national targets. In Vietnam, they already developed even indicators of their national development policies. So we linked this with the indicators of the SDGs. And that helped them a lot to to break the barrier and to, to start thinking of, yes, what I'm doing actually is impacting my implementation of the SDGs. And uh, to look at it and then identify the gaps where action was not happening. And that's where leverage points emerge, right? So. Thank you, Anita. And we do have a request from uh, uh, our colleague, Christine, who I believe sits with you in uh, Bangkok for uh, uh, she wants to uh, raise a question. Christine, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, this this was a really great presentation, and I think you know to see all the work that's evolved. I, I normally co uh, co collaborate with Katomi, but to see it all laid out and to see the effort, you know, and to see the, the fruit of the effort, you know, it's really great to see. Um, what I what I really wanted to sort of a comment and I ask, emerging from some of the comments that just happened, um, and and we're left in the chat as well. So we do a lot of, of work, including in the Maldives. And you know, I, I wanted to get your thoughts um, and experience on this. One of the things that we are noticing is, is kind of what was mentioned that we are designing more of our systems engagements for not for high level people. They can be included as, a, as part of the groups, but we go right down through the, through the citizenry. citizenry. Um, and sometimes we are, we're, we're even trying one now where we're reaching out to other agencies, IFIs, et cetera. So we can layer in uh, not only you know voices from the bottom up, but also try to, to um, accelerate the financing, uh, minimize the trade-offs, etc. But the question that I kind of had was was twofold. Um, we noticed, and I think you kind of touched on it, so I'm kind of curious if this is happening to you. We noticed that when we go into talk, especially if we want to 
expand the, 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 include the stakeholder group. Um, oddly enough, talking about state level SDGs, like right up front, doesn't work. <laughs> so we kind of focus on the development issue. We don't even bother to talk about SDGs yes. and this and outcome. We don't, we don't just talk exactly. Yeah. We talk about what problem, we know there's a complex issue, and then we let them talk their way through their perspective of the issue, no matter if it's not sophisticated or, you know, we don't expect them to tell me about you know, the, the, the nitrous oxide, this and that. No, we just say, is it smog? <laughs> is it haze or whatever the, the problem we're tackling? Um, but we find that it's actually not useful to use the word SDG in some of the, the, the exercises. We can come back after and layer on our, our own little mapping and say, well, this tackles that, but it's not very productive. And then the second thing is, you know, because it was raised about this nexus thing, um, you know, you kind of said it. The nexus talk is really something we create at higher level. And the fact of the matter is, is that the systems is there to organically generate the nexuses far beyond what we do. We have these nice pet packages of water, air, food, and this and that. And, you know, I personally think that we, we, we have to kind of realize that many of us, um, we have been working at this high level with all of these high level things. And I think in a way, COVID has broken a lot of that because we can't have all these international meetings with high level policy discussions. And it's kind of interesting to me that I'm seeing now that country offices are turning around and saying, I don't really want high level policy things. I want more systems things. So I just kind of curious if that's been your experience that simplifying speak, uh, really expanding the inclusion and moving more to mixing these stakeholders is something you see and if you think it's time for us even if we choose to do it for our internal reports to start moving away from this complex agency specific language about nexus this and all of these sorts of things so uh that's that sorry it was a bit long but those are the pieces that were running through my head thanks thank you christine um uh, and it had some views on that and i think you can also take that uh, with uh uh, the excellent comment from Zafar in the chat where um, he notes that there are knowledge and communication gaps between agencies and civil societies and of course some comp competition between uh, agencies for uh, for resources uh, and and that is uh, actually quite a significant barrier as well to uh, using systems thinking approach um, uh, because uh, agencies sort of uh, focus on their mandate sometimes. Yes, a very interesting concepts and ideas, Christine. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, on the slogans that we develop or the, the, the wording that we have, and then it becomes like coding, and then we go in meetings, we use it, and people have different perceptions. I just mentioned that the triple nexus can create conscious imaging for different people, different things, right? So that's what it is. And you're right. Um, going to a country and discussing with, with a broader stakeholder group, um, simple concepts of the development issues, and then going upwards and mapping them with SDG targets. When you define the action, you could say actually, but this is how you actually implementing SDG this target and that target, that's very good. Now there's pros and cons and including high political level people. It is important, especially if you have a chance to investigate a little bit, to do some interviews in the country where you're going to work first, to understand what is the situation. If the high political level sits into the cloud and is kind of like detached from, forgotten from where they come, that we all depend on each other and we cannot live without each other in a country, in the world, right? So um, if there's a, that type of people, um, is definitely beneficial for them, for their perspective, for their, um, after that impact on the policy implementation, because without this policy make, uh, this high level guys that are pushing a policy forward for funding, they go and defend it, right? Uh, or they broker partnerships with other ministers um, or other high level people. You need these people for, for the whole process. So it is important to engage them. And to give that space, I mean, it's other tools too, not only systems thinking. I mean, Hitomi can talk a little bit more. Maybe you should make another cafe about futures thinking, futures um, 
designing the, this futures that that stage you remember the aspiration so you need futures technique um, as well so people would have to aspire to some future to some solution of their problem it it pays back to involve the high level political people if they are really interested available if you manage to in 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 entice them to join the group and and to hear the views of the normal ordinary stakeholders that are impacted by the policies as well i think they just have to be in a different in a setting and maybe at some level maybe when you go as serge mentioned something right when you do the first mapping then you see there's another layer as you said in motives right there's a new layer, so you have to go deeper into a more technical mapping. And that way you could deal with the technical people, but you need to do the country, national level with the high level as well. They're important. I don't know if I answered this, uh, but Christine, we could see each other, have a yeah, coffee. Yeah, we can and, see each other and chat. And discuss, yeah. we discuss <laughs> oh. more, yeah. <laughs> definitely the empowerment of women and the engagement of women is very important because women have this multifaceted as perspective on things they always think of multiple interests to reconcile right yes, <laughs> apologies to the oh a sing, oh single parent men as well right or makes um, like uh, different types of couples right uh, groups the, the whole such. idea with this Aneta is to uh, to give it the, that feel of a coffee chat so uh, it's uh, that's great um the um we we do have a great point from uh, muhammad um uh, muhammad yasin uh, who is from mongolia so i was wondering if yes. muhammad you're still with us uh it would be great to to hear from you your perspective from mongolia directly uh, are you there muhammad yes i'm here so um yeah, it, it's a very interesting conversation. And I, in fact, right now I was working on an SDG integration uh, uh, project document. Uh, we are trying to come up with an SDG project uh, phase two. Uh, the earlier one is completing uh, this month. We want to scale it up. Uh, I, the, my comments are based on the difficulties that I faced. So uh, as I shared earlier on these three uh, questions, but uh, anyway, we are making progress and uh, we'll be able to complete the uh, project document. Uh, the, the biggest challenge is, well, uh, the Mongolia started off good with uh, a very good SDG um, plan, uh, development plan, which was praised by almost everybody and uh, showcased as an example. But then uh, due to government changes, uh, this is one of the factors. Uh, there is not much political instability over the long run. And uh, uh, in 2020, uh, late in 2021, uh, the government changed. Uh, it was I mean, the election was within a couple of years and uh, they came up with, during the pandemic, of course, priorities change. And now they have come up with Vision 2050. And after Vision 2050, now there is a um, new revival policy. And the new revival policy put a lot of emphasis on mining uh, and mineral sector development. And mining and mineral sector development is actually going to take away focus from, uh, uh, from environment and climate change action, and, and especially in, in the area of renewable energy, because Mongolia heavily relies on coal for energy production. And uh, uh, this has been our challenge. Uh, which we are trying to address, uh, working with the government. And hence, that's why I said the Vision 2050 uh, is not really aligned with the uh, earlier uh, sustainable development uh, uh, plan, 20, 2030 plan that they had come up in past. Uh, so this, this has been our challenge. And, uh, but we are trying to address it by working with the government at all levels. And uh, recently uh, we uh, 
heard in a, a discussions at the new um, economic forum uh, that the government is working on a midterm uh, targeted development plan. Targeted development plan will bridge the gap between the 2030 uh, uh, development plan and the uh, VN 2050, because some of the targets which were earlier uh, specified in uh, uh, development plan 2030, they were shifted to 2040 uh, as per the VN 2050. And that became our major concern that uh, this will not help the government to achieve uh, these targets. However, uh, one of the things that we are missing in this conversation is the recent challenge of uh, Ukraine war. Now, uh, just uh, uh, last week when we were having new economic forum, there was a youth protest and uh, by, by mainly by the youth who demanded control of inflation uh, because inflation has risen more than 20%, especially for food items and uh, increasing unemployment for youth. So government is now cutting uh, capital expenditures, uh, though it has, not, uh, it has not really made any impact on the um, overall budget deficit, but uh, there is a gesture by the government that they are cutting on capital expenditure and use, they will use hopefully targeted subsidies to avert the impact of imported inflation uh, that is because of the war. So uh, Ukraine uh, war impact is going to deal a lot of uh, efforts on regarding uh, SDG integration and uh, achievement of Agenda 2030. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, really adding layers of complexity, right? When you uh, expand the systems beyond national level and uh, look at international factors, and then you have the challenge of uh, 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 political transitions uh, at, at national level uh, that also affect priorities, so priorities shift. Aneta, we are at time, uh, three minutes over, so I'll give you uh, 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 30 seconds to, uh, to react to that and, uh, and give us your parting words uh, before we conclude. Yes, uh, I would like to thank everybody for joining and um, systems thinking issues, try to get into it. As uh, practitioners in the UN system, we all need that to open also to destroy our silos in our thinking, right? Um, this is, I believe, a must for a UN practitioner, uh, including other futurist uh, thinking and uh, other tools that we need to, to learn as well. Thank you very much. And I look to see you next time. Thank you, Aneta. Thank you, Tommy. It was really a pleasure to have you. Uh, many thanks for agreeing to, uh, to share your experience with, with us today. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for a very interactive session. Uh, we hope that uh, it was useful. Uh, you have uh, links in the chat to uh, more resources on the ESCAP repository about uh, systems thinking, uh, including training. Um, and and you, have, uh, you can always reach uh, all that information through the IPPN platform. You have the links uh, there on the screen as well. I would like to invite you to our next Knowledge Cafe, which is gonna be on 11th of May. Uh, we are gonna host colleagues from uh, IOM to talk about return and reintegration of migrants. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.